Riverside. Well, it's so good to have my guest on today. Larry, how are you doing this fine day? I am great, Pastor. I've been looking forward to this. I have been too, and this is going to be a great conversation, and it fits in with my goal of how do we build bridges and not destroy them. So looking forward to love how it. we can talk about that. Love it. Love it. Let me start off by asking you this question. Give me the best piece of advice you ever received. <clears throat> Yeah, you know, I was early on into my career, and this gentleman, very accomplished gentleman, said to me, son, the biggest part to success is showing up and showing up on time. I can't think of anything that gave me more direction and could speak to the life that I live today for something as simple as showing up and showing up on time. In fact, in the book, there's an entire chapter that's uh, entitled Our 16 Hours. And assuming that we sleep eight hours, you know, how you manage those 16 hours has everything to do with your success. Until you can manage time, you can manage nothing else. Yeah, that's really good. Um, I always, my goal in life is always be 30 minutes ahead of time. You know? <laughs> Arrive at a place 30 minutes early because you never know what might happen on your, on your way to the place you're heading. So you want to give yourself leeway to make sure you're always on time. Right. You should hear my uh, my maintenance. I think you know I do McDonald's. I think. Yep. Uh, I do, yep. So we have seven restaurants that uh, I own, my son and I. But my maintenance man gave me some of the best advice on time. He said to me one day, a uh, pastor, he says, Mr. Thornton, I'm always on time, whether I'm going to work or whether I'm visiting a church in Detroit, Michigan. I'm on time because I leave in time to be on time. <laughs> it doesn't get any simpler than that. That's exactly right. Exactly I leave right. in time to be on time. And I love it. Oh, I do too. Larry, I'm always curious. Everybody has people in their lives who served as an inspiration. I asked this question of my guests because I, I want to kind of give you an opportunity to maybe just kind of give a shout out to those people in your life who've been so much of an inspiration for you. Great. Well, uh, certainly I can start with my parents uh, having a loving home uh, to leave uh, as a 12 year old integrating schools in 67, 68. And I'm not given as much attention to that. I wonder sometimes and I struggle with how I got through those racial episodes but a lot of it, uh, Pastor Haney, had a lot to do with the fact that I left a loving home. I came back to a loving home. And you can imagine in 67, 68, uh, one of six black students to uh, attend and integrate this all white Goodwin Junior High School. And but the fact that I had loving parents, we never, ever, none of uh, my sisters nor I ever doubted the love that our mom and our dad had for us. And so I, I've never given a lot of thought to that, but it, it had a lot to do with that. And then, of course, you run into business uh, uh, icons like an A.G. Gaston, had a chance to shake his hand once, even before I got into business. And then just to watch and pay attention to the acumen of uh, those business entities that I uh, served and, and, and was around. But uh, <clears throat> I'd have to give. Perhaps greetings, though, to my senior English teacher. And if our time will allow, I'd love to get in because that was the pivotal moment for me. That is what turned the tide and put me on a path that I still enjoy to this very day. I love it. Share that story with us. That sounds interesting. I'm sorry? Yeah, share that with us. I'd love to hear that. Okay, well, let me see if I can get through it. So uh, I'm 12 years old in the ninth grade. And uh, you can imagine these tremendous messages of inferiority on a daily basis, the unspoken messages that uh, we received. Um, it, it was a, I turned off to school. Uh, I went to summer school that year, Pastor, and I would go on to Robert E. Lee High School in the 10th grade. Went to summer school that year, failed summer school. I simply turned off to school because the messaging was so powerful 
this number of people can't believe what they believe and there not be some truth to it. It's so how I felt at that time. I must be less than, I must be nothing. I must not have anything to contribute because that's the messaging that came uh, at us on a daily basis and I bought into it. And so I'm just trucking through, can't quit school. My mom wasn't gonna have that. And I've got to deal with this until I can somehow get out. I'll say this to you. I went to summer school every year, never, it didn't graduate with my class, but graduated in summer school. Uh, and I said this just the other day, had there been a category, Pastor Haney, that, that could have identified the most unlikely person to succeed in our yearbook, my photograph clearly would have been next to it. And so when I look at my life today, owning seven restaurants, sitting on the board of directors of three corporations, um, having authored a book that eight colleges and universities have put in place as a mandatory read, two colleges teach a course, the name of the course, uh, both at East Tennessee State University and Kennesaw State University have they, they both have a course, the name of the course to their honors students. Why not win? Well, what happened to Larry to produce today's Larry Thornton versus what happened uh, in the 11th grade? In the 11th grade, your purpose, it seemed, was to so position your schedule to take senior English from anybody other than this lady named Miss Nichols. Uh, just about every high school has at least one of these. And just to give you a little context, Miss Nichols was a retired World War II veteran. So need I say more? And this lady was firm, rigid. She would defy everything that I'd ever grown to appreciate in a teacher and a woman. Uh, firm, never heard a grading on the curve, just straight down the line. Miss Nichols assigned a book for me to read, Pastor. It was called The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. And I was fascinated with the characters as they would act out the essence of their names, charity, love, forgiveness, mercy. And it just connected with that artistic talent that I had. Ms. Nichols placed a B plus on my desk. She was shocked, I was shocked, but it was enough for her to know that there's something more to this kid. The grades and the reflections that are set, that's not who this guy is. Pastor, that is so true with so many of your parishioners, so many of your family members, misguided, misdirected, and she's going to do something about it. She invited me, Pastor, to do some yard work because she knew that that's what my dad and I did on Saturdays. We'd go to the white folks' house. Never knew the names, cutting and scraping and digging and the wax paper wrapped sandwiches out of the back door. When it was time for lunch, Ms. Nichols invited me in through the front door. Now, to a lot of your listeners, that's not a big deal. What's up with that? But in the late 60s, that didn't happen. So she's talking to me. She's sharing these wonderful gems of wisdom. But all I could think of was being downtown with my mom and, and, and when I wanted a hamburger and a, and a drink or Coke, you know, she would lead me downstairs where black folk ate. She never explained why, but I'm having these meandering tours in my mind. So I'm not listening to what Ms. Nichols is saying, but I'm paying careful attention to what she's doing. Is that not a strong statement? I think St. Francis of Assisi says it best. Go forth and preach the gospel always, and when necessary, use words. That's powerful. I was so busy listening to what she was doing that I heard very little of what she had to say. But Pastor, she recaptured my listening attention when she said to me, Larry, I think you ought to go to college. Now, understand, nobody had ever used my name in college in the same sentence. But because of who she was, Pastor, there's a message in here for your listeners to you and to me. We carry a lot more weight than we think. And the significance of what our words and what our comments can mean to change the lives 
I don't know if anybody else could have done that other than Ms. Nichols. And I had a kind of an awakening and went on to some little junior college. I'm studying art and the rest of uh, what I do today is history. So I've spent uh, essentially the first part of my young life relearning and redirecting that I did have something to offer. I did have something to uh, contribute. I could measure up. And I thank Ms. Nichols for her taking the time to go out of her way uh, to make a difference. I want to share something. I, I, I ran across this thing, and you've heard it before, I'm sure, too, is that if you accept the victim mind, mindset, you let the person who gives you that title control your life. And you kind of you just kind of express that in your story is that yep. that's the thing I, I find most disturbing about the conversation around people of color today, especially black people, is this victim mentality. And And when we accept that victim mentality. To me, we we give up power to be who God made us to be and created us to be because we just like, well, I can't do anything. My life is not worth anything. I'm not worth anything. Because to me, that's the, that's the message of being a victim. It's like, I'm not a victim. I'm an overcomer. And I love that word in the Greek because the, the word overcome is, is the word that Paul uses. I mean, we're, we're more than conquerors. We are overcomers. And that's what that, that word is. He's, he's kind of saying in the Greek. And it's like, we are so much more than a victim. Absolutely. Uh, and I love what you've just stated too, that phrase, more than a conqueror. It's not enough just to be a conqueror, but I am more than a conqueror. And once you understand that, and once I got that, um, seated in my brain and in my mind. And today it's more about creating those more than conqueror opportunities for so many others who uh, are in these classrooms today, uh, Pastor Haney. And I mean, there, there are many of you, there are many of me, but like I was misdirected and uh, we spend our time through the Institute. There's an Institute that's been generated from the book. All of this is a nonprofit. We're not making a dime. In fact, if someone, if someone told me that I'd be working this hard for free uh, at this point in my life, <laughs> I would never have believed it. But uh, I'm having the time of my life, uh, we think, making a difference. I want you to kind of tell us your story because I found your journey to what you led you to write this book as fascinating. Being one of the first to segregate a school, tell us, tell us that journey, your personal story. Yeah, so uh, as you know, Brown versus Board of Education <clears throat> of Topeka, Kansas, that landmark ruling was in 54. But the southern states, including, including Louisiana, the southern states would work with, with I'd call it diabolical creativity in avoiding the <laughs> Brown mandate. <laughs> it would be another 12 to 13 years before a little phrase in the state of Alabama was coined called freedom of choice. So we didn't have to go to Goodwin in the ninth grade, but we had this forward thinking attorney uh, who I resented because he went around canvassing, his daughter was included, one of the six of us, and I'm at Booker T. Washington in the seventh and eighth grade, and I'm fine, you know, why would my mom agree for me to go into that setting? And I never understood it. I never understood it for the first year, two, three years. But today, if I could go back to my 12 year old self, I would say, I know that you are afraid. I know you don't understand this, but if you can conquer this, it will mean, it would send a message that would be beyond your imagining to your community and to the world. Uh, I didn't realize, Pastor, that it was my time, my turn, even as a young kid, to lean in and participate in what was the right thing to do. Now, when you look at the fact that nine justices in 1954, nine white justices agreed unanimously that separate educational facilities were inherently unequal. And it would take several subsequent federal uh, local cases to unravel and add teeth to the Brown mandate. And that's when freedom of choice opened up. But it was a clearly a um, just a seminal moment for me 
uh, I, I wouldn't say that it was the first time that I realized that I was black, but it was clearly the first time that being black made a difference. And uh, that was a lot for a young mind. But when I look at my world today, being the first African-American to serve on the, on the board of directors of Coca-Cola. So I'm looking around a board table at faces, just like at Goodman in the ninth grade, that didn't look like mine. The first black to own a McDonald's in Birmingham. And my son and I are the only owners of a McDonald's. We've been doing it for 31 years now. The only black owners in Birmingham looking around a table. Sonova's Bank, board of directors, only African-American. And so I, I sometimes think, had I not learned, Pastor, how to become comfortable in this uncomfortable setting, perhaps I would have missed the opportunity that I enjoy today. One of two black presidents of the largest Kiwanis club in the world. Uh, those experiences might have been overwhelming had I not mastered it in the ninth and the 10th grade. We never know from a divine and serendipitous perspective what's happening to us, even though you might not understand it, what's happening to prepare us for a greater work. And um, I can't think of a better calling, a greater calling than the work that we are engaged in today to make a difference in trying to build a better community. And people understand sometimes what it means to be first. <laughs> you know, um, yes. <laughs> we, we underestimate how difficult that journey is. And I think we discredit it sometimes because it's like, well, you know, we, we, we look at Jackie Robinson and people like yourself and we go, eh, you know, it, it, it must have been our, it must have been not, not that yeah. difficult. And we, and we lose sight of the fact sometimes the amount of control that God has to give you oh. in those in those situations to, to be the first one because everything you do is magnified. Every, every reaction you have, every conversation you have, everything you say is under a microscope and you have to live life in a very small bubble that many of us never understand. And here's the other thing too, Pastor, there's so much unlearning, which is probably not even a word, so much redirection of thinking in order to do what you've just uh, illustrated. Imagine growing up with a social construct that sent messages without words. There's St. Francis of Assisi again, you know, without words, but it sent a message nonetheless. Um, when I was about six, five or six years old, I'm raised with three sisters. I have three sisters. This particular sister, this particular Christmas, one of my sisters received a black doll. And I remember my sister crying all day long in rejection of her own image. I remember clearly thinking, why did Santa Claus bring her that? Because as we sat there and we watched those cartoons on Saturday morning, every doll, every single one was blonde, blue eyed, Barbie, Susie Smart, or some other blonde, blue eyed doll. That's what my sister wanted. That's what all of her friends had. That's what my other sisters had. Now, my mother was trying to make a move, probably. In 1959, where did she even find a black doll? Which means that she had to work very hard to send a message to help us to see us differently. But Pastor, she failed. My sister never stopped crying until my mother eventually acquiesced and went out and purchase the doll that my sister could identify with. To conscientiously make a deliberate decision to say that today my baby is going to be happy. I'll save that battle for another day. And if my mother were alive, I'd love to have that conversation with her just to, to your earlier point, to, to hear how excruciatingly painful that must have been for her to go out, make it right, 
for in the eyes of my sister, but turn the wound and to create greater injury uh, from another perspective. We have had a very sordid and storied history. And for those of us uh, that God has been able to endow with an ability uh, to do a difference, we can't just do that for us, Pastor. And I know I'm preaching to the choir with you. That's why you have this podcast. That's this is why I wrote this book, because we want people to uh, understand more succinctly who they are and how they can get to uh, a more winning circumstance. When I was in elementary school in Louisiana, I was the only black in my uh, elementary school. And wow. the, the funny thing about it was I didn't realize how radical that was in the South in the seventies in Louisiana to be the only black in a Lutheran, Lutheran elementary school. What I did learn was there were two different me's. There was, <laughs> there was a school me who learned to talk like the people at school. And then I went home to my black neighborhood and had to change my language because if I didn't, I, I stood out like a sore thumb. I remember when I, when I went over to uh, junior high to all black school, and I came in and I didn't realize I was talking differently at school. They're like, yeah. are you from California? You talk funny. Uh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, how and about so I you, talk proper? I talk proper, yeah. It's like, so you had this, you had to learn how to st- flip on a dime yeah, and navigate. to live in two cultures. Yeah, you navigate it. Uh, too many of us have to do that. And uh, which is why it is so important that the message that we think that we're putting out, uh, as I said, there's an institute uh, that's been put together from the book, the Why Not Win Institute. And we're just having a wonderful time moving across college campuses, probably up to about 40 now that we've gone to. Here's one that stood out to us, and it happens to be the same school that's teaching the book. This is the third semester that they're teaching, and we show up every semester, and we talk about the program. But when we first went to East Tennessee State University, which is a 97% majority institution, only 3% people of color, we were dealing with 18 honors students, three of which said to us during that first session a couple of years ago, I have never met a Black person. And you think about how deep that is. I've seen, I've been around, but it's not as strange as you might think because you can go to your family and friends and say, how many Asians have you met? How many Hispanics have you not just seen, but you've really gotten to know them? Indians, we're working with this Indian uh, group who's trying to get a McDonald's franchise. They have a truck now. And it's awesome to be able to have that exchange. I've been invited to dinner. So that culture, you, you, you're coming out of your bubble when we, when we do that. So that stuck in my throat. And here's what we have done. And we are right on the cusp right now of making it happen. We are taking East Tennessee State University, 97% white. And we have partnered their honors students with Tennessee State University and HBCU. And Pastor, they're going to spend three to four days on each other's campus, getting to know, getting to feel the exposure. That's how you build community, in my mind. That's a start. And then we build upon that. Uh, After those three or four days, I am convinced that to both of those communities, you will see measurable and appreciable difference in their outlook on the world. It's impossible not to. I think it was, um, I can't think of who that was, maybe uh, Nightingale who said, a mind that has been stretched by a new idea can never again return to its original dimensions. And so the exposure element in my mind is just as important, just as significant as education itself. And I think what's interesting to me is education has now become the linchpin to all of our arguments. Um, I got a chance to spend yep. 10 years almost living in Milwaukee and experience the school choice program in Milwaukee. And what I really can't uh. figure out is why in the world one side of argument is against people being able to pick good schools for their kids. Because like you just yep. said, education yep. is the, is the, 
the door that gets us out of the, the bondage that we're in. I don't yeah. know why that's become a, a fight in so many of our communities. <laughs> wow. It's real. <laughs> it's real. It's real. But it's going to take, in my mind, those of us who are big enough to look past the immediate circumstance and be willing to make the difference, to take the heat. At least three times in my book, I put it this way. If you can't take anything, you can't have anything. The more you can take with grace and humility, the more you can have. And as I look over my life, the most unlikely person to be doing what I'm getting to do today, um, <clears throat> as I said, owning seven restaurants, sitting on three corporate boards where they pay you to come to a meeting for what you think with a degree in art. And let's contrast that to individuals who have master's degrees in business and can't run a lemonade stand. I think it's all about who sent you, Pastor. I think it's about <clears throat> who can be used <clears throat> for a greater work and a greater cause. I am so convinced of that. Um, we talk about one of your questions, talk about the five tenets uh, of winning and in, in, in our opinion. I, I've grown to believe this um, and my life speaks to it because I've never studied business at all. And yet I get a chance to do these wonderful things in business while I continue to do my art. But when I'm into the inner city schools, rarely am I talking about your respective area of discipline, your choice of uh, life interests. Although that's good, you should declare an interest, I get that. But what's far more important in my mind is that individual who will master relationship skills, you know, learn to relate to others, communication skills. And the experts will tell you that as much as 60% of all communication has nothing to do with speaking or writing. That's a scary but true axiom. Demeanor, deportment, disposition. Anybody who will master those five can pretty much, pretty much master his or her future. And we've seen the converse of that, those who are quite capable, two, three, four degrees, but do not relate well, do not communicate well, following up, showing up, not concerned about their disposition, demeanor, and deportment, and they miss their end terribly because they focused on what they thought were the critical skills. Well, I'll tell you that it bothers me every time I hear uh, those five referred to as soft skills. They are not soft skills, they are critical skills. And I've proven that with my life. Uh, I don't know of anybody that we've ever terminated on any of these boards that I serve on because of their competency level. In every case, it was an inability to get along to work well with others, to not have to fly off and give your opinion and give a piece of your mind as it were to every situation. You know, think of how the times that Christ could have given a piece of his mind and more with justification. That's the difference. Exactly. That's the example, isn't it? Wow. Well, you know, I just read a study in one of my classes this last summer was Emotional intelligence, we just talked about, you know, your ability to get along. The higher the, up you go to the ladder, the less executives have that ability to relate to people. Wow. Isn't that something? <laughs> Isn't that something? But it's so true. But we don't think of it in those terms. Yeah, we don't think of it in those terms. The I have a friend who was the first black chief justice in the state of Alabama. He's back litigating now with the firm. You should hear him talk about those individuals that they litigate cases for on an annual basis on behalf of physicians. <laughs> so you think about four years of undergrad, sitting for the MCAT, <clears throat> three, four years of medical school, passed the medical exam, three, four years of residency, but you never learn how to talk to people. 
And once you get that first lawsuit, the second lawsuit, malpractice, is hands off. You have all of this competency, but I can't work with people. I don't take that extra 15 to 20 minutes and empathize with the family on what has just happened or what is about to happen. Just right. absolutely interesting. Absolutely interesting. So when people <clears throat> pick up your book, Why Not Win, a, a reflective 50 year journey of a segregated South to America's boardrooms, what do you want them to, to get out of that book? Well, the first thing that I would want them to get out of it is the fact that I can win more completely. If I'm willing to put the work in, do the work, put the hard work in place. And I would argue that some of the most challenging work, Pastor, that we will ever do is the work that we will do on ourselves. Work harder on yourself than you do on any job. Learn that extra word. Read that extra book. Walk that extra mile. Drink another glass of water. Say no to that second slice of pie. Improve your attitude. Learn to say thank you, please, and excuse me more often. I'm telling you, it's everything. But we don't understand that. What do we do? We look out and we judge. What we do through the Institute is that we turn the tide. We turn the tide so that you feel your own personal accountability, your own personal discipline, your own personal responsibility in your capacity for winning in life. That's where the value is. In fact, it is nowhere else, you know. Uh, we paint our own world with a decision, simply. You know, but we don't think of it that way. Uh, here's a statement that I made just the other day. Life is interesting, but only to interesting people. And we don't think of it that way. Life is exciting, but only to exciting people. Life is dull, boring, lugubrious, but only to dull, boring, and lugubrious people. Pastor, it is also true that life is successful but only to successful people. If we understood that, and, and it's almost impossible to go through one of our courses without understanding personal accountability, personal responsibility. But what happens in my restaurants, and you see it around your parishioners, my employees will come and work for me at McDonald's three, four weeks, three, four months, leave mad at the manager, mad at me, maybe in my son, and never stop to think, how many times did I smile at the customer? How many times did I thank the customer and ask for repeat business? How many times did I call in when I really could have come to work? How many times did my grandmother die? You know, most people only have two. And so we, we do all of this. And then what, what happens, Pastor? We'll go across the street to a competitor and repeat the same thing and never stop to think, wow, we have more to do with our own growth and upward mobility than any boss, any manager ever did. We teach that and we push that through the Institute. Be on time, show up and show up on time. He said, 80% of your success will be predicated upon that. It made no sense to me at the time, something as small as that, but it's everything. And so when we try to change that, and once you change what you think, I mean, you'd have to agree with this, you change what you do. That's pretty simple, basic and ordinary, but yet so misunderstood by so many. Tell us more about your institute. <clears throat> The Why Not Win Institute was uh, designed by the lady who wrote the introduction to this book. She wrote it through the eyes of a piece of my artwork. And she's a second education doctor, Zilla Fluker. So I asked her to write the introduction. She came back to me and she said, Larry, I think we have something. And I'm thinking, you know, what are, what are you talking about? She said, I have extracted over 130 quotes from your manuscript. 
Well, obviously, I'm not writing quotable stuff in my mind, but she had them all segmented, Pastor. And I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, I said that. Yeah, yeah. And she's written a curriculum and we are having a wonderful time with the Institute. We did all of Birmingham City Schools. They bought 2,800 of these books. Uh, as I said, 100% of proceeds will go back to the Institute and helped us to get around to do the work that we do. Well, imagine two days ago, I'm in Montgomery, Alabama, where I integrated public schools in Montgomery at Robert E. Lee High School. And I'm in the auditorium speaking to the arts program, state uh, system-wide maybe 80 to 90 people. And all I can remember, and I had to force myself to stay focused on my message. I'm sure you've had to deal with some of this being a pastor. You know, I've got a message to deliver, but I'm being distracted. Well, here's what was distracting me. I hadn't been in that auditorium at Robert E. Lee High School since I was a student. And we had this speaker, Reverend Reverend Jordan of Lily Baptist Church in Montgomery. He's doing a black history program. This had to be in the year 69, 70 school year. And I watched those white students one by one, get up and leave one by one, every other sentence, they get up and leave and leave until that auditorium was just about empty. This pastor never missed a beat. I'm sitting in my chair, hurting and painting for him, but he knew his mission. He knew his purpose. He knew his calling, and he delivered, never relented, not once. I think it was my first lesson of strength under fire for me to sit there and see that. And I had a chance to meet uh, Reverend Jordan again about 15 years ago, and I recounted that story and he remembered being there. And uh, boy, what strength uh, I was able to deduct from that uh, circumstance. But to be at Robert E. Lee, where we have a local businessman, his name is George Goodwin, his granddaddy brother was mayor of Montgomery and a chief justice of the state. And Goodwin, where I integrated, <laughs> was named after him. This man is buying 3,000 of these books, and we're going to go and visit every seventh grade class and every high school 10th grade class, just the way we did in Birmingham. Uh, you know, we're just having a wonderful time through the Institute. We think, Pastor, making a difference. And just real quickly, three months ago, this book was uh, written, a graphic novel. And this is an illustrated version of this book with five or six of those stories and a, maybe a different, maybe an additional six or seven. This book has already, it's only been out three months. We have picked up five book awards from this graphic novel. It was scripted by Dr. Dave Ketchin of Auburn University's School of Business. And uh, this gentleman will buy 1,500 of these and 1,500 of the other book. So imagine me going back to Montgomery where I've integrated schools and, uh, you know, it's amazing how your life, how God, how the universe works when you have invested well into the universe. I love that, Larry. I love to ask my guests this question. I'm not going to talk to you all day, but I love to ask you this question. Um, <laughs> what do you want your legacy to be? You know, I, I rarely think about uh, legacy. Uh, I, I, in my opinion, one's legacy ought to be uh, separate from one's effort. That's just my personal opinion. Do the work, make a difference. And the legacy piece tends to take care of itself. Uh, the fact that my son being 10 years old, when we opened the first restaurant, uh, went on to graduate Miles College. Uh, he had the good sense to study business and he graduated <laughs> with a degree in business and went right into uh, the owner's program. And at 25 years old, Pastor, this young man became the youngest franchise owner of a McDonald's in the entire system at 25 years old. Uh, today, he is more and more, because of the book, more and more, he's running the business uh, today. He's 40 years old today. And uh, you talk about legacy. Uh, he's named after me. 
uh, Larry Dale Thornton Jr. Uh, the fact that we've been in business for 31 years, and I think given his passion for the business, uh, we can do another 30, 40 years uh, of being an asset and a blessing to uh, the community. We have always known since day one uh, that our business was not just a business. It was as much of a ministry as, as a business. And when we look at the thousands and thousands of jobs, the millions of dollars that we generated within the community uh, in the black community, we'd like to think that uh, we're, we're creating uh, and encouraging and motivating people so if I had to say what I wish the legacy would be, it would be that this man stood for uh, what was best for the total community. He was an inclusive thinking uh, individual who wanted everybody to win uh, as best they could. Love that. So, Larry, where can people find your book, Why Not Win? <laughs> Why Not Win it will be on all of your major book sites, Books Millions. Um, Barnes and Noble, certainly on Amazon. And uh, I'm telling you, these individuals are buying the books uh, by the thousands. Uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, certainly it crosses your mind. Why did you make it a nonprofit? <laughs> but, you know, you know, God has a way of taking care. He already has. So I feel so good about the work that we are doing and the why of the work that we're doing. But, uh, you know, we think here again that we're making a difference in the lives of of, um, of a lot of people. And where can people find you on social media if they want to follow you and find out, find out what you're doing? Uh, I think there's a, you know, I have these handlers today. They they kind of position all of this, but Larry Thornton, uh, dot com, I believe, is how I am paid. And then there's a Why Not Win uh, Institute page as well. Uh, every quarter, we have a report of some of the, uh, just a report out on some of the work that we're doing and uh, can't wait to uh, get into Montgomery and uh, get busy with some of those high schools, <clears throat> particularly where I integrated. That's going to be especially special. Well, Larry, thank you so much for the time and for your, the work that you've done, the the roads you've, you've, you've paved for so many others to follow you. Um, you're an inspiration to all of us who have still fighting the good fight and still trying to make a difference yep. for the positive in the world and know that uh, there's so many young people who have so much potential. If someone did like they did for you and just kind of like Miss Nichols did, just kind of pour into you and tell you that you have value and you are special. So I hope my audience who are listening to this podcast, who wonder if they have value, if they're special, hear from both of us Absolutely. that you, you have been, you've been created by God. You're a unique individual with the unique mission that God has given you to do. So we want you to go out there and to live out that God-given mission. Make your life about others and watch others make their lives about you. So simple, Amen. so basic. Yeah. Well, thank you, Larry. I really appreciate it. Pastor's been fun, and uh, I appreciate this opportunity. Thanks. <laughs>